Good evening and welcome to this online presentation for those people interested in being a Level 1 boat race official in New South Wales. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their connection to the land and certainly pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This presentation will follow some of the topics that are shown on uh, a presentation on the website under volunteering. So we'll follow through those and add some information to that as well. And that presentation is on the website and this one will be available for you online to review later as well. So I just want to go through a couple of points on the work that we currently do in New South Wales. We work everywhere from the Queensland border up near Mwilumba and we work down to Shoalhaven in the south and we're divided into regions which we term metropolitan around the Sydney area, central districts around uh, Taree and the Hunter and northern rivers from Grafton north to the border. Uh, regattas are currently held in Australia in all our states and in the ACT and we're occasionally involved in ACT regattas but we tend to focus mainly on New South Wales. All the training we do as officials is part of a national scheme known as the National Rowing Officiating Accreditation Scheme. There are some very minor adaptions within other states but essentially it's the same wherever you go. If you wish to be a volunteer and, and volunteer, sorry, volunteer as an official in New South Wales, you just need to be able to commit a little bit of time to regattas. So we expect that that would be a few regattas or maybe a, a, more than that. You'd want to have a basic or a better knowledge of the sport and you will need or need to develop a clear understanding of the rules and their intent. And we expect that would develop as you went along. And you will work with a team to develop that or to deliver uh, safe, fair and consistent rowing for all of our athletes. Rowing officials work on and off the water. We work before racing, during racing and after racing. You can see there before racing we're looking at boats and athletes and marshalling crews. During racing we're looking at the race itself from the start to the finish and judging. And after racing we're occasionally involved in spot checks on uh, coxswain's weights and we definitely look at decisions and adjudicate any protest as part of our work in the jury or as an individual official. To become a level one official, which is our introductory level, you need to come along to a regatta. You need to complete four short written tasks there with a pass of 80%. They cover those topics there, mastering umpire and judging and control commission. And then we add to that five hours of working as an official in a practical manner uh, with a mentor. Once you've done that work and your mentor has assessed that uh, you are um, deemed to be accredited as level one, that accreditation stands for four years and you'd gain further experience as you go along in those four years and develop further. This is the official page that shows the requirements and you see one of the requirements is that you're expected to be 16 years of age at least, not just 16. Uh, you must acknowledge and uh, sign the code of conduct. You must pass those tasks and do your five hours. And then to keep level one, over four years, you're expected to gather some points under practical and professional development. And these seminars and training are part of that professional development. Practical is working in your roles as an official. Starting you can see wasn't in there uh, and that's doing, it is a level two role and usually assigned to the more experienced officials. But certainly if you're a level one official and you're trying to become a level two official, then you would be involved in starts at some level. Level one officials work as part of the team. That team's known as the jury and level one officials work at virtually all of our regattas. The president of the jury is usually a person of, at a more experienced or a higher level, um, simply because they're the one that gets to make the decisions and uh, is in charge of uh, the more complex parts of the jury work and the regatta work. When we're at our larger regattas and we tend to have one or two extra people, we like to team our trainees up with uh, mentors even if they are an accredited level one or level two umpire, we occasionally put them out with a mentor 
and let them work through and, um, and gain their experience. So just some of the basics of what we do. We're involved in training wherever we go and whatever regatta we're at. Um, part of that training is seminars, as we say here, uh, working with mentors, uh, and sometimes just going to another place and working at another regatta is a good way to train as well. So the Sydney International Regatta Centre, or CIRC as most of us call it, is a great place to train because it's a, a very high quality course with some very good equipment built into that course and a great place to see racing at a very high level. Even though umpiring on you know, tidal rivers and open water on lakes can be difficult, and sometimes much more difficult than a fully buoyed course. But it's good to get the range of experience. If you've got a question, we'll do everything we can to answer that question for you. If we can't answer it on the spot, we'll do our best. But, but being out on the water or by the water and seeing things and having that experience is certainly the best way to learn, uh, particularly as an official, because things pop up that uh, you may not have expected. You achieve the level that you're comfortable to achieve. If you wish to go on to level two, three or beyond, then uh, you're more than welcome to do that. But if you decide that level one's the perfect spot for you to stay, then no one's going to criticise that either because every person and every job is important to us. We all do a little bit of training as we go along to remain current. It's a requirement in that four-year period, but um, we're all of the opinion that the, the more work you do, the better you become. And as I said earlier on, everyone's required to acknowledge a code of conduct and we're also required as volunteers to have a working with children check. Uh, they're obtained through Services New South Wales and Luke can give you the contact details for that if you don't have it. If you work in a profession that already requires it, then you would just let us know of that one and we can use that one. There's no difference. So some of the roles that you might work in, umpires, umpires work on the water and they work with a boat driver usually, or always. Uh, they either follow or observe races. They use flags and megaphones to assist in directing the crews. And their job is to make sure that racing is fair and safe. Uh, they would be the person that would first adjudicate an issue if it arose during the race. Uh, they would let the judges or any other officials know if any of the results might be affected by their decisions. And occasionally they marshal races as well and we use radios to gather information and communicate our decisions to other members on the jury. Umpiring is a very rewarding role and although you're out there in the sun or the rain, it's a great place to watch racing uh, and it's the only place that you can observe the entire race. There's two main forms of umpiring and I'll just demonstrate them with these photos. This is at a World Championships in Bulgaria uh, and these umpires are doing what's known as zonal umpiring. So umpire three is up near the start. The umpires further down the course are looking after each of their zones, and that just happens to be a para race, that one. This umpiring is what we, rec we refer to as following, and this umpire is come out at the start, and will follow that race all the way to the finish. That's a 1,000 metre race at a Masters Championships in Tasmania at Lake Barrington. Uh, marshalling is a role that we don't always see, but it's a very important part of the regatta and uh, the job of the marshal is to make sure that the crews are grouped up in their race and arrive to the start on time and, uh, let any, and to let anyone else know of anything that might affect that start or getting to the start on time. And part of their job would be to keep some pretty accurate records so that they can communicate to other people anything that may have come or they might be a person that's a, a great place to check to see if a crew's on the way or late. And just to illustrate, sometimes the jobs a marshal can do, this marshal's um, noticed that these two single scholars from the same club at a national championships have actually put the wrong number on their boat. So he's assisted them to swap that number over or done that for them. Um, so when they arrive at the start, they're in the right boat with the right person and the right number and there's no disruption whatsoever to the racing, so that's a nice proactive move by that official. Uh, this is the Masters Championships in Perth, and you can see that crews are marshalled up here, um, with the marshal on the water in this case, and they're grouped up for their race, ready to go and move into the start on time. 
Not every regatta uses a marshal, but it's one of those roles that can make a massive difference to a regatta. A, a good marshal uh, is vital to a very successful large regatta in particular. Aligners work at the start. Uh, they work usually on the side of the course and their job is to make sure that all crews are on the same line for each start and that their starts are fair and no one's gained any advantage and if somebody does break a start or gain an advantage then they can be issued a sanction like a yellow card and the aligner would inform the starter of that decision. One of the things that you will see later on or you will know when you're out there is that the aligner is the only person who can change a false start. And there's a set of crews lined up, ready for a start, on time, uh, ready to go at the Masters in Perth. Aligners are what we part of what we call a start team, and their their job is to make sure that the starts are fair for everybody, and that includes timing, not just the line. And that start team will sometimes cover starts at different positions. So at our regattas, we could quite commonly have starts at 1500, 1000 or 2,000 metres, and that start term would move up and down the course to those starts. Control commissions aren't always well known by a lot of people, but uh, at the larger regattas they work, and they work before the race, checking athletes and boats. Um, while racing's on, they're looking at traffic flow and making sure that everything's running smoothly and nobody's being hindered or, uh, or doing anything that's against the regulations or the rules. After racing they may check athletes and that would be coxswains in particular looking at their weights, not the weight of the coxswain but the weight they carry. And most people don't have a clear understanding but all boats are required to meet a minimum weight standard. And that control commission uh, will always work at national regattas but at state regattas we often look at the athletes, uh, weigh them before the races and check weights of coxswains after race if required. The boat weight can be very important. This boat, if you look up the records, it's uh, the World Juniors in Rio in 2015. This Australian crew came down the course and finished in fourth place. Their boat was checked after that and found not to meet the requirements. So if you look up the official records, you'll see that that boat came last in that race and is recorded as being underweight. So from fourth to last, simply because of the weight of their boat, which should have been checked by them before the race. And this is somebody checking their boat before a race to make sure that it does meet the weight requirements. Just a couple of, to illustrate a couple of important points, no matter what level you come in at, no matter what level you want to achieve, you'll get a lot of support from the team that you work with. Level 1 umpires don't go out and work on their own until they're confident to do that, and until then they work with a mentor and you decide the level that you wish to end up at. So if you decide level one's the best spot for you, then that's wonderful. If you decide to go to level three, then people will help you do that as well. And it wouldn't matter where you went in New South Wales, pretty well every regatta runs on the same principle and officials work in the same manner uh, wherever you go. So just to um, reiterate those levels, level one is our introductory level. That's what we're talking about now. Level 2 is a state umpire, so a level 2 umpire has been a level 1 for at least a year and done a few more tasks and achieved that level. Level 3 is a national level, so they're all state umpires, but after three years as a level 2 they can move on to level 3. So currently in New South Wales we've got 26 level 1s, 36 level 2s, and we've got 51 national umpires in Australia and quite a number of them are in New South Wales, so we work at all those regattas. Uh, international umpires are under a completely different system run by a group called World Rowing or FISA, but the way they work is very, very similar to a national regatta and has all of the same elements as a state regatta. And we've got 14 international umpires in Australia currently. Two in New South Wales and one just about to do an exam. So if you decide to be level one, where do you where do you start? And we'll start. The best way to, is to call the office or send an email to Luke. Um, the details for those contacts will be at the end of this presentation. Come along to a regatta, um, get your working with children check out of the way, 
and at that regatta you can work with a mentor and see what those roles are like. And then there's some written tasks that we spoke about right at the beginning of this, those four tasks. And after that, five hours of practical work with a mentor. And if you've met all the requirements and done all the work and, and done those hours, you'd be endorsed as a Level 1 umpire. And you've got four years at Level 1. Uh, and at the end of that four years, you're expected to have already re-accredited at Level 1 or sought to move up to Level 2 or 3, if that's what you want to do. So just a few questions that I've sort of tried to preempt and, and answer for you, but uh, the first question is what's going on here? This is coastal rowing, which is a fairly new form of uh, international rowing, and this is in Hong Kong. And they row around a course with turning points, and this is uh, a bit of a problem at one of the turning points caused by one of the Great Britain crews, and that's one of the reasons why we need officials in coastal rowing. So part of Part of the issue there is that there are time penalties applied to people who cause problems at turning points. And the Great Britain crew on the top left certainly uh, incurred one of those time penalties for that. So this presentation will be available after this and you'll be able to see a copy of it and go through it at your leisure and uh, pick up any info you need from there. Where are the regattas? The regattas are all over the state and there is a calendar on the website under regattas which will show the dates and locations for all of those. Uh, currently the calendar says that everything's either been cancelled or it's not on. So that's something we'll work through but uh, hopefully at the end of July we might see the JB Sharp series start again and a great place to train so if you need details of that talk to Luke and find out where that is and, and how it works. Training is done by the umpires that are already accredited at those levels and, and we try and give you the more experienced umpires to assist with your training uh, and it can be done at any regatta anywhere in New South Wales. The best time it starts any time but if you start at the Joe Sharpa earlier in the season, uh, it just means that you can work through that season and keep your experience going. So Joe Sharps, as I said, we're talking July. Our season tends to start uh, around late September, October, uh, and that's, that's a good point to start. Uh, once you work as an official, as a trainee or an official, uh, New South Wales supplies a uniform, which is essentially a shirt and a hat. They'll also supply meals, sunscreens and anything else required, certainly all the radios and flags and so on. We tend to bring our own wet weather gear and binoculars and stopwatches and things like that, but um, pretty well everything else is supplied. On the day, we usually meet an hour before the first race, uh, and we go through um, what's required for the day and the roles that you'd have um, in the morning and the afternoon. The sessions, morning and afternoon sessions, we usually have two sessions um, on any day. Most regattas are only one day, but there are some of the larger regattas that run over two and three days. Um, when do you work on your own? Well, you decide that. So you let us know when you're confident to work on your own, and uh, if you've been endorsed to work on your own, then that certainly would be the case, and those roles are assigned by the president of the jury, the person in charge at, at the regatta each time but you decide when you're ready to work on your own. No one's going to just thrust you out there. Who do you work with? Well, as I said, our mentors tend to be our more experienced officials. We've got um, people who from all walks of life, uh, and they're all keen to do the job. They come from rowing backgrounds. They come from family rowing backgrounds. Uh, they're sometimes officials in other sports as well. Some work at local level and some work at international level, so you'll, you'll meet a wide range of people uh, that you work with. The rules are on the website under Regatta's Laws of Boat Racing, and my suggestion would be that you have a look at those rules, read through them, print them off if you need to, write some notes on them, and if you've got questions, then ask and find out an answer to those questions, because... I find that uh, no matter what rules you read, there will always be questions and there always is an intent to those rules that you need to understand as well, which is quite difficult to write into just the rules themselves. Any other questions from this presentation or anywhere else, you know, ask Luke or ask one of the officials. 
uh, I often say to people, if you've got a question, it means that somebody else probably wants to know the same thing. Uh, and once you've got a question, make sure you get an answer to that question. Don't, um, don't be fobbed off, and I wouldn't expect you would be by anybody that you asked here either. So the contact information after this, uh, the New South Wales office number is there. The office email's there and Luke's email's uh, there as well. So Luke's our contact and he's the, the best person to go to. If you're in the regions and you want to know uh, the best person to speak to, again, I'd suggest that you just uh, contact Luke and tell him where you are and what regatta you want to work at. And I'm sure he'll um, be more than happy to pass on the contacts, the best person to contact for uh, that regatta and in that circumstance. So just to finish off, this is Coastal Rowing again. It just shows that um, as an umpire you can end up in some pretty amazing places and some pretty amazing circumstances. This is a race around Hong Kong Island and these are para rowers. So these are people who arrive at the regatta in a wheelchair and row 35 kilometres around the course. On In this case on Hong Kong Arbor with, um, as you can see, high speed ferries and all sorts of things going past and an umpire on a safety boat. Um, working with them uh, throughout the entire regatta. So they, uh, they rode there for around about eight hours, but it was certainly a wonderful thing. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you've got uh, what you need out of this presentation, but if you need anything else, you've also got the contact details there. Um, so I'd encourage you to go through those. If you need any other information like the Code of Conduct or Working with Children link or the assessment task, then Contact Luke by all means and he can he can certainly give you all of that information. So thank you very much.